You're listening to the What the Wrestling Podcast, the show that brings you all things wrestling with your host, RJD. Oh, you already know what time it is. <clears throat> oh, that was terrible. Yeah, I got the flu, y'all. Sick as a dog. But we will power through. We will power through. So, if I sound a little low, that is why. But... What I won't sound low on is my socials. Check them out. Follow me. RJD, RJ699 on Twitter, RJD199 on Snapchat. Don't forget to follow What The Wrestling on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow What The Wrestling on Spotify and Anchor. Let's go. Yes, 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 tis I, RJD here. Welcome to What The Wrestling. I am your very, very, very sick host, RJD. I will not be yelling. I might have to take an intermission. I don't know, I might have to clean some things up. I'm going to need y'all not to judge me because we got a lot to talk about. We got to talk about TK Regal and we got the Dynamite review but my throat is killing me i just really want to rush through this but we're going to drive slow we're going to make sure we knock everything out and excuse my enthusiasm or lack thereof i can't force my voice too much otherwise i'm just going to be coughing and hurling all over the camera (coughs) and i'm sure you guys don't want that so with that being said I probably will have to take an intermission to get my tea, but hit the goddamn like button, like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Ah, oh, man. I love wrestling. I love talking to you guys, and that's why I am, I am here when I should be resting up in my bed, but I am here to talk about AEW Dynamite. I'm out here looking crazy. I actually should put my hat on. I'm out here looking crazy, but we're going to get it done, baby. We're going to get it done. Now, with that being said, let's talk about TK. TK. TK um, recently was on a call, and he talked about how his mother had multiple strokes and this is going to roll right into the conversation he had with William Regal. But TK had a lot on his plate this fall. Uh, he had the all-out nonsense with Punk and the Bucks. But he was also dealing with something very, very personal. Tony Khan mentioned on a Ring of Honor media call, after the all-out pay-per-view, his mother suffered a stroke coming out of the event. Uh, that was a horrible time for the family. On top of the AEW issues. So there was a lot going on there. So Tony Khan said between between All Out and Grand Slam, his mother had a stroke, and it was a rough time for the family. In addition to the to the stuff from All Out, to make things more complicated, a few weeks after the episode, his mother had another stroke in October. Tony Khan did uh, did not reportedly mention 
how his mother is doing in a media call about her recovery from the second stroke. Uh, he noticed that after they got her home and spent time with her, his mother had another stroke in, a, in October. Just horrible, horrible freaking news. Him dealing with all of this on top of the stuff with All Out is just... It, it, that had to be extremely rough for him and his family on top of the All Out stuff. And it was around this time where people started looking at AEW like... Well, they're kind of falling off a little bit. They're not as... The, the, the shows aren't as hot as they used to be. What the hell's going on with the writing? And, and now, listening to it, it kind of all makes sense. We had some not bad shows during that time, but we had some uh, I hate shows during that time. But if he's trying to deal with all of this and then he's worried about his mother and all of this other stuff, and then he has a whole investigation because of the all out stuff all at the same time then yeah i could see how that could be very very rough on his mental for sure uh as somebody who has had issues as somebody's mother who has had issues being in and out of hospital and he was on the call saying that you know he's in the hospital with his family and uh, it just wanted her to be okay I completely sympathize with this guy and I respect TK coming out of this phone call with the stuff with Regal and the stuff with his family. I respect him a lot more now than I did going into it because he really didn't have to do what he did for Regal. Now, there are some stipulations there. Let's not get it twisted. But he really did not have to do what he did to help William Regal. But at the end of the day, he went and sat down with Regal outside of a hospital on a park bench. And he was said that it is said that he had talked to Regal for 90 minutes, like the longest he's ever talked to anybody. And um, he heard Regal out. Now, Tony Khan says William Regal had a lot of good reasons for going back, especially his son, considering where he was with his mother at that point. He said that he understood that letting Regal out of his deal in that situation was the best move for them. Tony Khan said William Regal is with AEW through the holidays, but they're going to make some on-screen sacrifices to help him do the right thing for his family because they feel it is the right thing. Tony Khan also said that his mother is improving as well. So they have him through, they have Regal through the holidays, and it was no secret that Regal was going back to WWE, and it was no secret because people had came out, hold on, people had came out saying that Regal was regretting his decision and blah, 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 blah. you can't listen to all of that stuff, Okay. Well, I know EC3 came on and said, oh, William Regal regretted it and all this other bullshit. But listen, if I didn't hear Regal say it and Regal didn't tell it to anybody, or if I didn't hear Tony Khan say it, like a lot of people say, a lot of people said that that was straight up bullshit. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Whatever his reasons for wanting to go back to WWE, he, he was granted his, I guess, con unconditional re uh, conditional release. So, because Tony Khan, he's going through this thing with his mother, he's so, he's talking about family, and he's talking about, listen, in regards to family, in regards to everything that's going on with me and my, uh, with my mother, I want you to be as close to your family as can be, and if that's the reason you want to go over there, let's work out a deal so that you can go over there and be happy with your family, and that's what they did. So, Tony was asked about Regal's release and if it is unconditional or if he's allowed to appear as a talent. Tony says that he believes the deal allows him to coach, but that he will not be appearing as an on-air talent next year. Says he was surprised by Triple H's tweet about Regal as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, here's the deal. I think, <coughs> I think Regal signed a one-year deal with a one-year option. 
So if that is the case, then if that is the case, then the option, the option is he's released, but that option is going to make sure that he does not appear on screen for as long as that option is in place. So if he had a one-year option, then he won't be on screen for one year. So that includes all of 2023. So 2024, he'll be back on screen. One would guess. So that's what I'm assuming because if he signed a two a one-year deal with a one-year option and he got let out and he asked Tony Khan not to renew his option, Tony Khan said, okay, I won't renew it, but you can go over there, but can't have you on screen. And I got to make sacrifices because William Regal is all through and through right now. AEW, he's all through it. So you can't just not put him on TV. And you got to explain this away. We got to change storylines because they had William Regal in the plans. So him not picking up that option makes perfect sense. And him not being able to be an on-screen talent for the remainder of his contract makes perfect sense as well. So he won't be on WWE TV no time soon. So get that out of your mind. So listen, I got hell of a lot of respect for Tony Khan. He really, really, really didn't have to do. He really didn't have to do what he did for Regal, but he did. And it's kind of dope that he did. It's kind of dope that he did. I have much respect for him. Perfect. He's a stand-up guy. The only thing I'm surprised is, is why are you surprised that Triple H put out the War Games, War Games, War Games tweet? WWE does not play well with others. WWE takes little jabs at other companies whenever they can. They try to shit on other companies. That's how they, that's what they do. That's how they've always been. So, why is this all of a sudden news to Tony Khan that Triple H will put out a War Games tweet knowing, probably knowing that William Regal was coming back? Come on, bruv. Come on. You should have known better than that. Tony Khan be getting so emotional when it comes to WWE. And I don't understand why. I don't understand why. Why are you getting so emotional when you know WWE fucks with people intentionally? You know this. You know this. You stupid. Just roll with the punches, baby. You take shots at them, they take shots at you. Don't get so emotional over this, TK. You know they're going to do whatever they could do to crush you. Just keep it moving, keep it pushing, and do what you do best. And that's putting on great shows like last night. Let's talk about Dynamite. AEW Dynamite coming to you live from Texas. Austin, if I'm not mistaken. What a beautiful, beautiful, lively crowd. They get the Don DeMarco. DeMarco. This crowd was A1 all night last night. I love this crowd. I wish every crowd was like this. Crowds like this make a good show great. Make a great show phenomenal. Shout out to the crowd. I wish every crowd was like this Austin, Texas crowd. Shout out to them. All right. I got to go get some tea, so I will be right back. Enjoy the sweet sounds of Casey Sasson de Goya as I re-up on my tea because, as you can see, I'm getting nasal. Be back in about 60 seconds.
All right, we back, we back. <sighs> Sorry about the delay, but yeah, it's whew, more tea is needed. Whew, okay. Oh, man. We got to stay with a hot brew of tea. So, Texas. First thing we had up is the Dynamite Diamond Ring Battle Royal. Ricky Starks, Jungle Boy, Dustin Rhodes, they all got TV entrances. But we had Orange Cassidy in there, Kip Sabian. We had a bunch of The Butcher, The Blade, Dalton Castle, and The Boys. We had a bunch of different people in this match. Uh, we had Orange Cassidy getting dumped out quick but because of Kip Sabian. We had... Uh, we had uh, Dustin Rhodes getting rid of Kip Sabian. We had uh, The Butcher and Dustin uh, getting eliminated. We had Dawson, Dalton Castle gets dumped out by Brian Cage. The boys save him. They get dumped out again. The boys save him. He gets dumped out again. The boys save him. They carry him over to, <coughs> to another side of the ring. He ends up coming into the ring. And Brian Cage just picks him up and then throws him out on some big boy status. Jesus Christ. Stop it. <clears throat> Get some help. So that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. We had Jungle Boy. Jungle, Jungle Boy out there getting rid of some people. Um, I think he got rid of Brian Cage. Hitting a Meteora on him. Uh, this ended up coming down to Matt Hardy. To Matt Hardy, Ethan Page, and Ricky Starks. So Matt Hardy was told by Ethan Page to hit and beat up on Ricky Starks, but he powered up like he wasn't gonna do it. Crowd gets hyped, but being that Ethan Page owns him, he ended up doing it anyway. Ricky Starks turns the table, throws him out, and then Ricky Starks gets picked up by Ethan Page and while Ethan Page tries to throw him out like power slam style, he holds onto the ropes and Ethan Page throws himself out. So Ricky Starks eliminates Ethan Page for the win. And before his music could even hit, MJF Surprise, comes down and he brought his A game to the sticks. I have put on Twitter when this happened, Ethan, uh, Ricky Starks. And MJF on the sticks? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Let's hit him with the... So, he gets on the mic and says, The little birdie told me Brian Danielson didn't show up tonight. And he says he knows why. Because he's terrified of him and what he did to William Regal. He's a bad, bad man. And that's why in a week's time, he is going to be a four-time Diamond Diamond Ring champion. And still going to be world champion. Now, hold on, hold on. Stop the show. Stop the show. Stop the show. Stop it. This is weird to me. If the Dynamite Diamond Ring was on the line, I thought this match right here was supposed to be the Dynamite Diamond Ring winner. But apparently, the Dynamite Diamond Ring is on the line and the AEW World Championship is on the line next week. Which is weird, because I thought it would have been one or the other, but instead they put them both on the line at the same time. Kind of doesn't make sense, but okay, cool, whatever. Not going to get too mad at that. It's cool. So he then turns his attention to Ricky Starks, and he says, uh, The truth is, you're, you're a talented wrestler, but compared to MJF, you are the drizzling shits. Or should he say you a Rudy Pooh candy ass? Since Starks basically has stolen everything else from that guy. He says, Ricky... You're nothing more than a dollar uh, than a dollar store Dwayne. And he says, so he's going to start calling you the pebble. <laughs> so this got humongous laughter from and chance of pebble from the crowd. So I was basically like, oh, nope. Ricky, or, uh, Ricky better come with it. So he says next week he's going to uh, go in his pocket. He's going to hop in his brand new Porsche. Take the pebble out and he's going to skip it all the way back to Billy Corgan's NWA so Ricky can wrestle on YouTube where he belongs so that he doesn't care that he's absolute because he is a generational talent and his reign of terror has just begun so 
Round one goes to MJF. So Ricky Starks pretty much walks by him, elbows him like this, gets the mic, and then he says, the first thing he the first thing he says, he needed to get the crowd. He needed to get the crowd immediately. And the first thing he says, he's saying, look, Maxi Pad, he should have expected a fifth rate Roddy Piper wannabe to come out here and try to steal the spotlight. So immediately the crowd starts chanting, Maxi Pad, Maxi Pad, and MJF is like, shut up, shut up. You stupid. Then he says, oh, you trashed the city. Oh, you trashed the people. How much more stick you got because that long hanging fruit is running, fruit is running dry. Every week MJF comes out here smelling like paint thinner, paint thinner and ass. His eczema, uh, his eczema looks like he laid down an, on an ant, on an ant hill for seven days. His clothes don't fit. His clothes don't fit. His scarf is shitty and he thinks he's better than moi. Give me a break. So at this point, he's got the crown. He's like, everything about Max is cheap. Uh, screams cheap from his suits to his heat to his AEW world champion. He's like, that title comes with responsibility that MJF knows nothing about. The difference between them is that he gives the people a reason to keep cheering while Max, Max lets everybody down. He can run off because he got out politic by somebody smarter than him. But Ricky's here every week. Uh, Freeman avoids pressure. Starks uh, Starks uh, he t uh, Starks takes it in. He does meet and greets. And besides his nose being a lot darker than the rest of his body, Ricky leaves with R Ricky leaves with dignity and respect. When he was living in his car in South Austin, he was grinding. And Max thinks that just because he plays people, uh, he pays people his ass to kiss, that he can get whatever he wants. Nope. Nope. Next week is a big deal, and next week he's gonna stomp a mud hole. Of his neck, he's gonna stomp his asshole in, and he's gonna make that title. He's gonna take that title and do him a favor and remove, uh, res remove the responsibility. He's gonna take the responsibility off his plate. Uh, round two goes to Absolute Ricky Stocks. So these guys right here did their goddamn thing. I hope that they revisit this. Because after I saw this promo by these two men, I was just sitting there like, Give me a hell yeah. I said, Give me a hell yeah. To both of these guys, because they are both freaking fantastic. Uh, MJF didn't like this very much, and he hit him in the huevos. He hit him in the little rickies. And he tried to hit him with the dynamite diamond ring, but Ricky Starks hit him with an awesome looking spear. Stood tall, grabbed the grabbed the belt, and he stood tall in lieu of their championship match next week. Now I'm gonna be honest. We all know the outcome to this, but I hope that they revisit this because this is how you usher in the new talent. This is how you book your homegrown guys at the top of the card. No WWE guys, no NXT guys, two homegrown talent, straight, straight from AEW, fighting, killing it on the promos, and fighting for the title, getting the crowd invested. This was awesome. We had a Darby Allen promo since says he felt lost since he lost the TNT Championship, and Samoa Joe will have to bury him to keep him away from it. We have Joe. With a promo saying that uh, he's a curious little dead boy and he's cracking up so bad and he's gonna miss the rest of his promo because hey curiosity has a cost back from commercial Mox cuts a promo he says last week didn't get out of hand and he's really starting to like Adam Page because he he, he did the talking with his fists too much of that around here too much talking and he said, this is all elite wrestling, not all elite talking. This is the sport of kings. And tonight, he and Willett and Claudio, this weekend, they bring back 100% proof ass kicking to pro wrestling. He's so over the JAS, and he's going to be out there tonight to ensure that there's no sports entertainment shenanigans. And if Hangman wants another piece, he knows where to find him. 
Then we had Darby versus Samoa Joe. Uh, first of all, Darby Allen. Holy shit. It's like my Fuck this shit, I'm out. Mm -mm. Listen, Darby has made peace with the fact that he's probably not going to wrestle that long into his 30s and 40s and because his body is going to be too fucking beat up. Darby Allen makes everybody he's in the ring with look like a million bucks. On top of the fact, he takes crazy ass bumps. Samoa Joe did the walk off. He did the walk away. Oh, here comes some cat. You're going to see a fluffy tail come up here in a minute. Samoa Darby went for the torpedo Darby. And Samoa Joe just did the walk off. I love the, the walk off Joe. He threw him into the barricade. He gave him a power slam onto the concrete. He threw him against. He threw. No, don't come. Don't sit on me. He threw him against the ring post. And Darby did like a 360 onto the floor. He barely makes it in by 10. He hit him with a Uranagi and a Senton. Uh, Darby. Um, Darby throws Joe into the steel, steel steps towards the end of the match. And. He hits Samoa Joe with the coffin drop. <coughs> now, he tries to throw him back in. And he ends up going up for another coffin drop. And unfortunately, that was countered into the Coquina Clutch. He did the coffin drop right into Joe. And Joe just, and put Darby to sleep. So, afterwards, a frustrated Darby Allen says, This ain't over, motherfucker. <laughs> I read his lips. He was like, Surprise, motherfucker. This ain't over. I'm still coming after you. So what happened was, Samoa Joe, after Darby Allen slaps him, Samoa Joe headbutts him, and then he gets Darby's skateboard. He threatens to hit the ref. The ref runs out of there. And then he puts it wheels up, and I already knew where this was going, and I was like, Diablo, coño, man. He puts him up for the muscle buster, and muscle bust... Muscle busters him onto the skateboard wheels. Yikes. Get the fuck out of here. Stop it. Get some help. Darby, 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 my brother. Oh, man. That hurt. That hurt my back just looking at it. Shit. <sighs> back for commercial. They get a high reel for Chris Jericho's match against Claudio Casting the only uh, final battle. And then that takes us into... Backpool Combat Club, Claudio Wheeler Yuta versus JAS, Danny Garcia, and Jake Hager. Uh, this was a standard match, solid match. The end came where Hager had an anchor lock and the up kick breaks it. There was a sunset flip onto him. There was a giant Cesaro swing. Or oh, a giant swing. We don't call him Cesaro no more. John Moxley cut off Sammy Guevara because he was trying to interfere. Claudio dives and gets caught in a Big high ankle uh, spinning spine buster. Uh, there was an ankle lock put back on. <coughs> Excuse me. Castagnoli reaching for Yuta. Runs in, but Garcia puts Yuta into the dragon tamer. Uh, Jake maneuvering Claudio around, but he gets swung into the other two. And then Claudio pops him up for the huge pop-up uppercut. And that was all she wrote. Tony Schiavone then got in the ring, and there was an interview with William Regal. That he said was from two weeks ago. And they played that on the screen. While the BCC was in the ring. So Rigo said people will only see this if something bad happens to him. And he says he took great exception to what MJF did to Tony. And he's mad about the emails. And, all, and, he, and so he gave him what he wanted. He's world champion. Be careful what you wish for. Because everybody in his company will be chasing him. He realized months ago that he was uh, that he was surplus to requirements to the Backboot Combat Club, but he knew that they wouldn't let him go. So he wanted to show them that he could go and that they would teach Wheeler and make him the best wrestler he can be, and they'll see what he does and take the example. He says this is his final lesson. Always stay one step ahead. Always keep eyes in the back of your head. He's Blackpool Combat Club until the day he dies, and it's been emotional. So, back in the ring, Moxie and Claudio look confused. They take a minute. 
Moxley says he only knows one thing for sure. These three men in the ring live and breathe pro wrestling. And you can call them whatever you want. But at final battle, this war with the JAS is over. Good stuff. Now, stop the show. Stop the show. The stuff with Regal, I understand. Because they had to find a way to explain him off of TV. And I think they did a pretty solid job of doing that. I think... I think the explanation with that they gave, which was two weeks ago, I think they did a pretty good job of explaining that. I think William Regal is, uh, I think William Regal did a lot of good in AEW, and I think he's going to do a lot of good backstage in WWE. And Blackpool Combat Club is okay. They'll be fine. They'll be fine without Regal. They'll be all right. No big deal. But I do think that they did a decent job of explaining what the hell this is. So, Tony Schiavone had a sit-down interview with Jamie Hayter. She says the division is getting interesting, but she is at the top of the totem pole. And she's going to do her job and defend the title. She says whoever wins out of Sheeta and the Bunny on Rampage will get to wrestle her from the title. Because she's a fighting champion. Good for her. Then we had Jade Cargill and the Baddies. Versus Kara Hogan, Madison Rain, and Sky Blue. We had Jade win with the Jaded. That was all she wrote. Uh, that was all she wrote with this. So, Jade Cargill and the Baddies win with the Jaded. That was your token women's match on this show. Backstage, Tony Savani interviewed Soraya, but before any questions could happen, the doctor, Britt Baker DMD, came. She congratulated Soraya on the biggest win of her career. She promises it won't ever happen again. She says Saria came to AEW and her first match was a pay-per-view match against the biggest star in the show. And she has two plane tickets for January 11th where Saria can either sit in the front row or she can have a match. Not against Britt in the singles, but in a tag match against her and Jamie Hayter. Commentary, uh, so that was that. Commentary uh, hyped up the matches for next week. And then we had the main event, FTR. Versus the acclaimed. Now, I'm not going to lie to y'all. I was worried about this match. Because I love FTR. So do the people. I love the acclaimed. So do the people. And I was wondering, damn, do you want to beat... You, do you want to take the titles off the acclaimed so soon? Probably not. <coughs> then I was like, damn, do you want to beat FTR when they're hot? Probably not. So, I don't know. I don't know. So, I was worried about this. I'm not even going to lie. But, this match was good. It came down to the wire. And I love the ending of this match, too. So, the ending. So, let's pick it up from halfway point. Uh, they were looking for a double brain buster. Bowers reverses. Excuse my talking, y'all. Y'all know I'm, I'm sick. Bowens reversed it. There was a small package onto a rolling elbow, but neither did the job. There was an uh, ace crusher. Uh, they were looking for the big rig, but Caster blocks it. He gets Dax up. Harwell reverses it, pass, uh, throws him into the turnbuckle, but Caster gets up and uh, hits the big rig. Bowens breaks it up. They hit Caster with the big rig. Bowens breaks it up. With literally .99999 to go. That was a great near fall. Uh, Anthony hits. Uh, Anthony Bowens hits the arrival. Caster goes up. Goes for the mic drop. But nobody home. Bowens with a diving lariat. On hardwood onto the floor. Cash hits him with a. Glory face buster. Max rolls him up for a two. They were trading big strikes back and forth. A lariat. Uh, big lariat. Swipes. Uh, basically not cast her out. A second lariat knocks him out again. Wheeler draws him up and hits a third. Then there was a power bomb. Max rolls through, and the acclaimed win with a roll up pin by Max from Max Caster on Cash Wheeler to retain the AEW World Tag Team Titles. I'm actually gonna go back and watch this match again because I like the way it was structured. I like the way it just kept building and building and building. And by the end of this match, the crowd was fully invested. The crowd was invested from the beginning. And by the end of this match, 
it was just these guys on point. Um, and I love the I love the fact that they rolled that you didn't know who was gonna win, and they won by a roll up. See, I love roll up wins when it comes like this because this roll up win came out of nowhere. Now, after the match, they all scissored in the middle of the ring. They all gave each other respect. Everybody had respect, which is dope. The crowd loved it. But then after the match, the ass boys came on the big screen and the, and the ass boys said, listen, <coughs> they've got presents for FTR. They have a card from them boys, the Briscoes, challenging them to a match at final battle, a double dog collar match. And FTR's music hit, and that was all she wrote for this show. So, nothing but good stuff here. This was all dope. I loved it. This was great. Shout out to shout out to AEW for putting on a great AEW Dynamite. I loved it. And with that being said, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go make sure that I can breathe in the next ten minutes. So. Thank you guys for rocking with me. We got through the show. I will be back tomorrow with more news and more on what's going on around AEW and WWE. But for right now, check out my social one more time. Everybody be safe out there because I am out. Peace. Dumb the monk goes.